Hi everyone, it's Nicola Burton from The Music Reel. I'm from Music Means Business. We've got Manny from the Pushworth Group here with us. And a very special international guest, we have Ali Cook, who's from New Zealand. Now, Ali is a regular visitor to Australia as an artist. She's an artist, composer, a publicist and promoter. And she's still in lockdown over in New Zealand. So we thought we'd catch up with her today to see how life is treating her as a live artist not gigging and in lockdown in New Zealand. How are you, Ali? Kia ora, tenakwe. Uh, hello from New Zealand. Um, so, yes, we've been in a very stiff lockdown, one of the stiffest uh, lockdowns in the world, um, but it's paying off. So um, we went hard and we went early, and uh, it looks like that's paying off. We've had a few days without any cases or one or two cases, and right. we're coming down. And Thankfully, they're talking bubble, so we might get back over to see you again soon as they open the borders between the two countries. Excellent. So now, when you say they hit it hard and they hit it fast, what was the difference between what New Zealand did and what Australia did? Okay, so before we even had a death, um, we had a few cases here. They decided to hit hard and early, and so everything shut down. So basically, the wow. streets of Auckland were blank. Um, you, w you weren't allowed to go outside of your home uh, for anything other than groceries or a doctor's appointment, which had to be in your car out the back or whatever, um, wow. or by phone, uh, or to go to chemists to get essential medicine. So everything, every bar, every restaurant, every takeaway, no, no, no takeaways, no nothing. Wow, because so, we've had, when we walk around the city in the morning, there's building sites with builders, tradies. It's just chock-a-block in our lockdown. Okay, so, yeah, we've just had the change to that now. So we've moved from what's called alert level four, which is full lockdown, to alert level three. And that is where um, industry has gone back, but with social distancing and the rest of us have to remain at home. Wow. So unless, unless you are on your way to your job, or on your way back from your job in industry, uh, you're not to leave your property. Wow. But the upshot <laughs> of that is, is that give it another week or so, and we won't have a single case of COVID-19 in this country. Wow. So we would have become the first country to wipe it out. So actually that strategy has been quite effective. We're doing the Bledisloe low cup of COVID-19 <laughs> kill. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I know Manny was working with you earlier this year when you were touring Australia with Ganga Jane. So Manny, yeah. what have you, what would you like to talk to Ali about? Well, I guess, um, you know, in the first instance, you know, when will the All Blacks reign come to an end, Ali? <laughs> I know, no, no, Manny kidding. <laughs> That's highly well, unlikely any time. No, it is highly <laughs> unlikely, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, the way that it's faring at the moment. But look, unfortunately, your cricket team, you know, what can yeah. I say? Bad no, luck it's there. A, it's, a, it's a bit of a bummer, but hey. That's you know. it. But there's a wonderful rivalry, you know, like in sporting terms. I guess it's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, the shows that we booked for you were all great shows with Ganga Jang. Um, yeah. I mean, it was a great invitation from Ganga Jang to, it, to um, introduce us and, and we're looking forward to booking more tours for you, you know, like here in Australia yeah. to support releases. And um, I guess, like in terms of a, a touring artist in New Zealand, you've had a taste of probably at a feature level here in Australia and obviously touring with Ganga Jang in, at some feature events and some feature venues. What's the difference, I guess, in, you know, touring in New Zealand, you know, versus touring um, in, like, like in Australia? That's what I'd, got, I'd, I'd be curious about. Not that we, you know, we've toured, you know, various acts throughout the ages uh, across the ditch, so to speak. Yeah. But I, I'd like to hear it firsthand from an artist. Yeah, okay. So, first of all, um, the distances, for starters. Uh, there's much more vast distance between uh, travelling from one gig to another in, in Australia as opposed to New Zealand. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that's in a negative or in a way, but your gas prices are cheaper. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> that's, that's helpful. Um, but it's sort of quite interesting. I, I played a lot up in like the Kimberley, Kinanara, mm -hmm. out in yep. Alice Springs, those kind of 
places and they're further for me from Sydney than I am from Sydney. So yeah. the distance of New Zealand to Australia, and I guess that's something that I've paved the way in some ways for a lot of artists that have come in after me is that I've lived in New Zealand, unusually a Kiwi that actually goes home. Um, <laughs> and, and I've managed to maintain a career coming back and forth. And I, I sort of always say it's just a movie and a coffee away to get mm. there, you know. That's true. Um, in New Zealand, we don't have the large community radio base mm -hmm. that Australia's got. So that, I think, you know, you've only, I guess we're smaller you know, it's 20 odd million versus 5 million. Um, so there's less media anyway. So with touring, there's maybe not as much individual media in each town. Like you go to a town in Australia, you've got the commercial station there, you've got the ABC station there, you've got, and then you've got the community station. We don't have that. So it's wow. a bit harder, in fact. Because right, so everyone listen to that, how lucky we are in Australia when it comes to publicity and media, that we've got far more resources and, and avenues and mediums available than they do across the ditch in New Zealand. I didn't realise that, Ali. That's, yeah, we that's don't have that know. community network and I really value that Australian community network. Even though there may be less people listening to those little stations, when you add them all up, there are actually a lot of people and they're much easier for an independent artist to access, get their music on, get an interview on, than perhaps a commercial or an ABC is always a little bit trickier, you know? It's always a bit more sought after, so it's harder to get on, um, yeah. Well, you make it look easy, and it's good for artists to hear this, because as we've been yeah. talking in all of our um, podcasts, it's all about being independent, building your music brand, and mm -hmm. you know, you're not dependent on a label anymore, so it's really good to hear Ali say that. Now, Ali, I know you've been doing some lectures lately about crowdfunding for the music industry. Yes, I have done that today, actually, with Auckland right. University, your mains up there, yeah. Okay, great. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, so, um, well, my I, I've always been in both sides of the industry, right? So I, I was a late starter. I mean, I started in the other side of the industry for the promotion side of it, with Kevin and O'Neill and Associates writing wow. posters in 1985 or, oh. or something. So I kind of got into the industry of that side of it to learn because I thought I need to know these things to be able to release my music. And then I got caught up. And so I got caught up and working in that side, but I kept writing songs and kept my kind of hand in. And then I decided at 47 years of age, that I would release my debut album. And wow. I thought, how am I going to get the money? I know all the know-how. I can get myself on the radio. I can get myself on the TV. I can do all those things because I do them for other people and they pay me to do it. Uh, and I was the fifth person, I think, in New Zealand to crowdfund an album. So I did uh, this one here. I raised 20,000 US... Um, from 258 people from 17 countries and it took me three and a half weeks to do it. So that was in the oh. heyday of crowdfunding. So I had 20,000 US, went out and got myself a great producer and produced my debut album. Um, and then the second one, I went through a European website and I raised 18,000 euro, um, which gave me enough to record and release that album and make a video clip, same with the other one. And then this one here um, came about from meeting Buzz and I still raised mm. without using a platform through my own website, 12,000 Australian, and then went into partnership with, <sighs> with um, SBD Music, Dave Buzz and, and, um, and Sebastian, Sebastian. Chase and yeah. as MGM. And so I did a joint venture and then used my 12,000 to produce and promote so um right. yeah so i've crowdfunded three albums now and uh about four music videos and a tour to the uk uh, right so it can be done yeah. everyone and if you want to know any more information like ali i'll put all of ali's links in yeah. because seriously if she can do that it's yeah. it's it's possible and you know but you have to understand your music brand and your target market don't you 
Yeah, and also um, what I found was, and I found it really on the first album, was that it wasn't just about the money. It was the other things that happened. I met these people on the net. I ended up with two festivals in Europe. I ended up in a magazine over in England. I ended up on radio stations across the globe from people who were connected, who'd funded my album. And then, and then they yeah. felt like they were part of that album. So they yes. wanted to help me. Right. And it was this exchange of, of they gave me 25 bucks in advance to make an album or they might've given me a bit more or whatever. And then they decided, you know, oh, I've got that friend that's a DJ or oh, I know that guy that runs a festival. I should get her on that bill. And so, so it was more than the money. It was the community that, that built around each album um, right. that has helped me do some amazing things. Yeah, so you've built brilliant. your own music community and that's yeah. critical in the survival of your music brand. Wow, yeah. Ali, what a great story. Yeah, you're right. not reliant on any major labels. No. You're not reliant. It's Love all it. about your own intellectual sensibility, yes. how you connect with people and it's, yep. an independ it's another independent model that you can use to build a, a musical career, which is absolutely brilliant, Ali. That's a... Wonderful insight, absolutely brilliant. And the, the thing is, is that they're super fans when you think it's quite funny, like in my small way, say that one that was 254 people for 20,000 US raised. And from that, I did a European tour and got a couple of festivals and magazines and all that sort of thing. Um, it, it's a super group of fans. So it's smaller but then, yes. you know, like celebrity is one person at a distance from hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a small super group and the internet, you've kind of got this exchange of I help you, you know, you help me and I provide you with the music. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be very big mm -hmm. to actually allow you to continue with your career and allow you to continue yeah. to record. It Beautiful. doesn't have to be a big group. It only has to be a small group. And... Yeah. That's something that I was talking to students to uh, this morning um, is that one super fan that will back you for three albums and come to the gig wherever you are that's closest to them, they are worth more than 400 likes who couldn't give a toss. You're better Absolutely. with the one person who actually, you know, so think about it as one fan at a time. I would rather have a thousand super fans than 20,000 likes that look good, mm -hmm. but yep. they're not active fans. And yes. Even with established artists, like I work with Sharon O'Neill quite a lot and she has quite a small social media thing because it's, she's an ex major artist obviously, and has been big in her time. And so she's only got 3000 fans on her page likes, but I sold two entire concerts in New Zealand in 48 hours by putting it on her Facebook page. Wow. All 3,000 of them worship the ground she work, walks mm -hmm. on. Yes. And we had people who put, who were turning up to the bar from Australia, all over Australia, and putting their bags behind the bar. <laughs> and they'd never been to, they got on a plane and they'd come because she never... She only ever sort of does the one or two things where she does those group shows, you know, where she does a couple of hits. Yeah. But she hadn't done a whole complete 75 minute show in 30 years. And, wow. but a very powerful fan base that showed me that somebody with 3000 likes that adore them mm -hmm. is a really powerful thing. If there are 3000 people that actually would jump on a plane to go see you anywhere. Wow, yeah, so absolutely. the whole concept of the super fan is something that we'll be talking along about, you know, in future posts. I think it's that's so important. Very important. And one thing I do want to say to you, Ali, you wrote this song with um, Kay and Buzz Bidstrip called We Hold yeah. Up Half the Sky. Yes. It is one of the best songs. I can't get it out of my head. And um, can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Because I think that's quite a significant song. Yeah, so we hold up half the sky as like women lifting up the world. And I mean, that's it. I'm, you know, I'm quite a strong woman figure. And Kay originally started writing the song 
from watching, I think she watched a documentary and, and it was about women in the world and, um, you know, it, it's a woman empowerment song. And I mean, I had one of those on my first album with Country Storm too. I'm, I'm kind of into that. I, I think that women, you know, save the planet. Oh, look at our prime minister. What a gal. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's sort of like, yeah. uh, it, it's that, it's that whole thing of empowerment and it doesn't matter whether you're a, a woman on a dirt floor with a baby or you're a woman in a cafe in New York, you've all got a role to play. That's in right. Being part of lifting the world up and that's what that song's about. And it's my personal favourite song off my own album. Oh, look, I agree well. with you. I, it's a great song. I'll actually <laughs> put the link into this post for everyone because I think, um, you know, we've had you know, time out, time's up, we've had Me Too movement, and this is a great song for anyone who's been involved in those movements. Just, you know, and I know this yeah. is aside from what we're talking about, but it's a great yep. song. Now, finally, yep. one question for you, the most, in question, most important question. <laughs> if you could time travel back to December, what message would you give yourself? Oh, that's, that's, that's an interesting one. If I could time back to December. Um, just to value everything that's around you. Uh, and I think that that's the one thing that has amazed me. Where I am here, I'm rural, rural and, and the whole country came to a stop. And I just got up, I started sleeping with, um, you know, biorhythms, getting up as the sun splashed into my room and trying to go to bed as it went dark. And I was getting up at six o'clock in the morning and there was, I really realized how much background noise we lived with, like there was none. And all wow. of a sudden, all the native birds were just coming in closer and closer to the house and the farm, and there was no road noise, no nothing. Lovely. I looked up in the sky, and the sky had turned to a blue like I've never seen it, with no jets going over from Christchurch to Wellington or from Wellington to Sydney, which goes that's that's how I tell what time it is I go there's the 415 to Sydney like, <laughs> you know, so like, oh. um, and just nothing and nature and it's been happening everywhere there's been kangaroos yes. around Australia just bouncing into parts mm -hmm. of town they're not and goats and in, um, in, mm -hmm. in Scotland and and the monkeys and in, in Thailand of going rampant because there's no <laughs> There's no tourists to feed them. And the other day I saw a flock of dugong, which are like those sea mammals, mm. that were right in by a Thailand beach that are endangered, that have never oh. been seen. And they're there feeding. And in and, and Venice, you know, dolphins coming up the canals. I mean, mm. we have to appreciate the earth. And if one thing it's taught me is how much the earth needs a break. Yeah, and so and it's in some ways, one. as dreadful as it's been for business and as dreadful as it's been for all of us, I think nature's had the biggest break, and it's oh. that's been a positive out of it. So, great answer, great answer. Appreciating, appreciating what we it's made me appreciate what we have. And How wonderful, Ali. Appreciated that more. It's been so good to talk to you, and in particular, talking everyone about crowdfunding and about the super fan. Yeah. That's such yeah. an important thing as a live music brand to really think yeah. about. Watch this video a few times with Ali and I'll put her contact yeah. details in because there's so much more for us to learn. And Ali, yeah. it's been a pleasure. Take care and we'll Thank see you, you when you come back to Australia. Yeah, I miss see you. Ya, Ali. Yeah. See you soon. <laughs> see Bye, ya. Everyone. Thank you.